Generation ships. The reason why vaults are evil in Fallout is to build these things. I'm Josephine in my new space machine. Come and we'll cast off. Let's blast off. Flying through space in a lover's embrace to the Milky Way. Oh, happy day. In the world of Fallout, vault was an American defense corporation responsible for creating the vaults, vast underground bunkers built before the Great War. Finalized in the mid-21st century, in the midst of growing global tensions, the vaults appealed to many citizens who saw the worsening state of their world. Many applied for vault residency in the hopes of saving themselves and their loved ones from the nuclear annihilation advertised right on their Radiation King TVs. Less than a million were accepted before the bombs fell. Protected from the fallout, vault residents would have looked forward to the lives promised to them, unaware that they'd been lied to. For only a select few vaults, dubbed control vaults, were truly designed to protect inhabitants. The rest were made as social experiments, using their populations as human guinea pigs, each vault serving a different purpose to subject its residents to, and study their suffering. But why exactly? What reason would any government subject its citizens to these conditions, in a scenario where, surely, you'd want to guarantee human survival? Keep in mind that even a limited nuclear exchange could have grave consequences for ecology and our populations. A full-blown nuclear war, like the one in Fallout setting, would be the stuff of nightmares. So why make the vaults this way? Why do this to the few human survivors left? Finally, we have an answer. According to Fallout's creator, Tim Kaine, the true purpose of vaults was for the head of the Enclave, as well as the US government, to figure out the technologies needed for building a generation starship in the event that the Earth became inhospitable post-war rather than saving a small portion of Americans only to release them into a radioactive wasteland, the head of the Enclave, working with vault -Tec, intended to use the vaults as testing grounds to build and perfect technologies that would transport mankind to the stars. But keep in mind that these space technologies wouldn't be designed with a light-speed starship in mind. Instead, a generation ship was being designed, where entire generations of passengers would live and die aboard the ship before it ever reached its destination. And while there existed atomic power, there didn't exist the technology needed to guarantee long-term space survival. Things like cryostasis, plant producers, and other necessities needed to be accounted for. If humanity's survival was a trolley problem, then the one person was of all populations. I'd highly recommend giving Tim's video a watch. I figure it's the most definitive answer we have about vault -Tec's intentions at the moment. The video's name is literally the true purpose of vaults and Fallout, and it comes from the creator of the series. So until Bethesda reveals what their idea on the purpose of vaults is, we've got this to turn to. It should count for something. But I didn't want to end the video there because there's so much this idea leaves to the imagination. With this newfound perspective, I'm going to be brainstorming why every vault in Fallout is evil. Before we start, here's some quick side notes. I'm going to elaborate on this hypothesis a little more. The reason why every vault is evil is to study and develop new technology for a generation spaceship meant to save mankind. And certain vaults were made to study sociological and psychological variables that would factor into making rules or protocols for the ship. No control or non-canon vaults are going to be covered, with the exception being vaults from the Fallout Bible. This is a series of game documents from Fallout designer Chris Avalon, which Bethesda uses time to time for inspiration. Email. Would the Bible be considered a canon property 
or a oh. non-canon one? For us, canon always starts with what is in the games. It's what is in Fallout One, Fallout Two, um, even some like Fall Tactics is is there's some stuff from Canon that from Fall Tactics as well in our our Fall games. So we always look at the, what's in the games first, and then we go to the Fall Bible and look at the stuff. So some of the stuff that is in Fallout Three that is now Canon came from the Fall Bible, some of that fiction. So we we look at it. We have we don't just assume that everything in the Bible is Canon. We have to look mm -hmm. at it step by step and, and decide. So yeah, it's it, it's a it's a judgment call. Fallout's wasteland is mostly inhabitable, and humanity is doing all right hundreds of years into the future. Wouldn't this make the Vault tests and the entire plan to go into space all for nothing? Well, not exactly. See, the US government and Enclave Head were likely planning for all possible contingencies, not just limited to nuclear destruction. For example, there existed Chinese biological weapons, and what we see of the repurposed FEV in Fallout 2 and 3, developed during the post-apocalypse no less, is absolutely terrifying. Your death has sealed the fate of everyone else on Earth. The Enclave triumphs, releasing the FEV virus into the atmosphere. Millions die, and the Earth falls silent again. If the Americans could develop weapons after nuclear annihilation that could eradicate mankind, there is very good reason the Americans wanted to go to space. One of Fallout's design inspirations was the French post-apocalyptic film La Jetée, where World War III left the surface world uninhabitable and forced mankind beneath the Earth. Its slideshow style inspired Fallout's iconic intro sequence, but the film also inspired Terry Gilliam's Twelve Monkeys. A film about a virus which left the surface world uninhabitable and forced mankind beneath the earth. I just wanted to point these movies out because I think they help visually showcase the type of fears that the US government and Enclave would have that went into them justifying the vault experiments. I also just generally recommend them because they're great. We're sending you to the third quarter of 11 tested its inhabitants' willingness to sacrifice one life for the safety of the majority. Residents were told that they would all be killed by the Volt computer if an annual sacrifice was not made. The Volt evolved into cruel, manipulative factions that eventually warred with one another, leaving only five survivors remaining. These survivors decided to spite the system and refused to make a sacrifice, but instead of being wiped out by the Volt computer, they received this automated message. Congratulations, citizens of Vault 11. You have made the decision not to sacrifice one of your own. You can walk with your head held high, knowing that your commitment to human life is a shining example to us all. And to make that feeling of pride even sweeter, I have some exciting news. Despite what you were led to believe, the population of Vault 11 is not going to be exterminated for its disobedience. Instead, the mechanism to open the main vault door has now been enabled, and you can come and go at your leisure. But not so fast. Be sure to check with your overseer to find out if it's safe to leave. Here at Vault Tech, your safety is our number one priority. Four of the five survivors were unable to live with themselves. A final testament to the cruelty of Vault 11. So how does this translate into making a spaceship? In a couple of ways. The most obvious being an understanding and instilling obedience. The human overseer, the person with the most power in the vault, was overpowered and sacrificed first. The overseer name became worthless, used as a label for future sacrifices in Vault 11. But the vault dwellers still deferred to the computer and its warnings, convincing them to take the lives of their fellow men. Where there was an extreme authority, there was extreme obedience, 
until the will to live was lost. Furthermore, we see that Voltec actually went through the efforts of designing a sacrificial chamber, so it could have been a planned feature on the ship. Say there's an overpopulation issue and balance needs to be restored. The sacrifice program is activated until that problem's resolved. Plus, since the Vault 11 residents didn't initially rebel against the sacrificial protocol, even in the unfairest of circumstances, when there was no overpopulation to speak of, it'd probably be considered good to go. The birthplace of Necropolis Ghouls, Vault 12 tested the effects of radiation exposure on its residents, deliberately designing its vault door not to close. Besides learning more about the most obvious side effects of radiation on a human being, the vault would also prove useful in gathering information on a micro-society's reactions to radiation exposure. After all, the generation ship would be powered by atomic energy, and maintenance issues, in most drastic of circumstances, may radiate some of the crew. More data on its specific effects would be nice to have, at the expense of just one little vault. Does next on the menu ring a bell for ya, normie? Vault 15 tested its population stability, placing a large, overcrowded group of people from different ethnic and religious backgrounds together and delaying the vault's opening by decades. This led to a schism which produced a number of raider gangs, including the Khans, Jackals, and Vipers. Inhabitants who did not turn to the raider lifestyle left and founded Shady Sands, which would go on to become capital of the NCR. Vault 15 would have taught Voltec the effects of overcrowding the finite corridors a spaceship would have, and it likely played a role into determining which demographics could be eligible members of the space crew, something that fallout xenophobic American government would most likely be concerned with. The vault was probably overcrowded on purpose to exasperate any cultural or racial tensions between demographics, just to gather data that confirmed the researchers' biases. Morally speaking, it wouldn't be too out there. Vault 19 divided its population into two sections, the red and blue sectors, minimizing their contact and beginning the vault's true purpose to induce paranoia through non-violent and non-chemical means. By the time of New Vegas, the vault was inhabited by Samuel Cook and his powder gangers, who claimed they'd found it devoid of life. Though the fate of the vault inhabitants is unknown, the experiment forced upon them is plain to see. This is a good time to bring up the game Colony Ship, which is not only inspired by Fallout, but set on the same type of generation ship we've been discussing. It's also a game about factions. Colony ship setting is a generation ship, where generations of inhabitants have already lived and died without the ship yet reaching its destination. However, descendants of the original crew began to factionalize over time. Tensions grew and led to a full-blown civil war called the Mutiny, and generations later, there are still those dealing with the aftermath. This is not a good thing. Never mind the loss of life, damage to the ship could lead to irreversible system destruction or failures later down the line. You want uniformity. You want loyalty to the mission. You don't want factions or dissidents stirring enough trouble that you have a revolution on your plate, and then lose your core reactor in the crossfire. Bolt 19 could have been used to gain an understanding on how to promote mistrust amongst the space crew. By learning how to divide and dehumanize select groups, you gain a good method of nipping dissidents in the bud while maintaining the loyalty of the majority. They'd be manipulated into fearing the faction and wouldn't care for its fate at the hands of ship authorities. Built in Las Vegas, Vault 21 was designed so that any conflict between Vault residents would be resolved through gambling. Any differences or problems were solved through the likes of Blackjack, and the vault, in the words of its terminal entries, was a perfect equilibrium between self-reliance and self-equality. While it's clear Voltec was studying conflict resolution for when personal issues would arise on a spaceship, I propose a more elaborate explanation. Voltec was trying to successfully design a criminal justice system that resolves conflicts through chance instead of through human judgment that might foster tension or factionalization in the future. See, the criminal justice system is not a justice-based system. It is a decision-based system. 
as well as an alternative to warfare. But decisions are human, and regardless of the society's best intentions, there will be slip-ups. There will inevitably be negligence, error, and, in the worst cases, the abuse of power. For these reasons and many more, even the criminal justice system, this alternative to warfare, has led to heightened social tensions throughout history, in some cases to all-out civil war. And while you can have a war on Earth, it's a lot worse on a spaceship, with its crucial components that determine the survival of an entire population. Vault 21 employs a criminal justice system that removes a human component. Rather than relying on human judgment, pure luck and chance are the basis of determining decisions. Pure luck and chance are what gets blamed instead of one's fellow man. In the context of a generation ship, this would mean a lower likelihood of blood feuds spanning generations, civil wars, or social tension, helping vault foster the illusion of social equality amongst the stars. Vault-22's inhabitants were scientists, given the task of learning how to sustain a vault population with plants grown inside of it. Research also went into crop production methods meant to protect crops from harsh post-war conditions, such as drought and insects. The vault would have been made to learn how to create a sustainable food source on a generation ship. This is not a case like the International Space Station, where the crew would receive periodic shipments of food. Once the generation ships out of orbit, that's that. It need a self-sufficient system that guarantees indefinite food production for the generations it'll take to reach the destination. Moreover, Vol 22's study of crop production wasn't just for post-war conditions. It was likely that Voltec wanted to know how to grow food on a different planet, if that would be possible. Developing stronger, healthier plants that could withstand alien temperature or fauna would be a good idea considering the goal is to eventually live on the planet, not just a ship. Vault 27 was intentionally overcrowded with 2,000 residents. This is quote, double the total sustainable amount a vault is supposed to have. Though only mentioned in the Fall of Bible and with no physical appearance yet in the series, one can only imagine the horrific consequences overcrowding must have had on this vault. If we can see the consequence Vault 15's total population caused, imagine what Vault 27 must have been like. Perhaps the vault was meant to definitively prove why there should be a certain occupancy limit. Some may have questioned the conservative approach of sending only a limited amount of people into space, especially if there was a bulk of richer government types willing to buy their way on board. Vault 27 could have been used as a way to dismantle arguments and prevent a future veto to the limit. Vault 29 is mentioned in the Fallout 76 holotape as only housing, quote, obnoxious rich teenagers. That's all we really know about Vault 29 so far. Unless you consider the Van Buren design documents for Interplay's version of Fallout 3. These are considered non-canon and already there's been material in them that's officially retconned. However, like the Fallout Bible, there's still a chance some inspiration might come from these design docs. Van Buren's Vault 29 was also a vault filled with children. It was controlled by a Zax supercomputer, programmed to help raise the children, teach them to be primitive, and then release them into a controlled society when they were old enough. Interestingly enough, it's also the vault where Harold would have emerged from. There's a lot more to Vault 29 in these documents, but it pertains to outside influences. What we're looking for is vault Tech's intentions for the vault, which do seem based around technology's ability to care for and influence humankind. Here you have a bunch of kids and teenagers who have already had lives above ground, raised by parents and taught the values of America. Then they're placed in a vault with robotic caretakers who teach them how to live this primitive lifestyle, contrary to everything they've been raised to be, preparing them for a world beyond the vault. It sounds like vault Tech wanted to test if younger generations would be able to be influenced by these robots with their messages and lessons on preparing for a new world. 
Originally, I wondered why not entrust a human teacher or authority with these lessons, but it hit me. What if humanity alone is entrusted to maintain generational stability on the ship? In Vault 29's case, the older generations are entrusted to pass on important lessons to their young. The robots could be a contingency in place for the space mission values being forgotten or diluted over time. What happens when an older generation fails its young and spoils it? Can a youth be influenced to believe in something that goes against everything they've been born and raised to be? Can a stupid, spoiled brat still be molded towards anything? Primitive life for the vault, planetary conquest for the ship. Vault 34 gave its residents the right to bear arms, as well as an extensive armory. When problems arose, the overseer could control the locks on the armory, denying access whenever they wanted. This inevitably led to protests, riots, and an exodus of vault dwellers who became the boomers tribe. Later down the line, an overpopulation crisis led to the overseer proposing control measures which angered a good chunk of the residents. In their fight against the overseer and control of the armory, critical components of the vault were damaged, including the reactor, which began to leak radiation and was unrepairable. Worse yet, the exit was no longer able to be opened from the inside, trapping every inhabitant of Vault 34 and dooming them. It seems that vault -Tec was testing whether or not those living in a confined space could be entrusted with firearms, or if this would lead to unfortunate circumstances. Vault 34's fate is truly terrifying, and going back to the Vault 21 explanation I gave, it's basically the worst case scenario possible. Critical systems were damaged by fighting and resulted in complete annihilation of the population. A slow, painful death by radiation poisoning, or of corruption into feral ghouls, cursed to live. I'd imagine vault -Tec knew something like this might happen, and these ideas may have factored into development on policies against common gun ownership. Sacrificing the Second Amendment is not good, but in shooting for the stars, it had been something that vault -Tec may have wanted to quash, with the data to back it up. Vault 36 had really bad food. Like, really, really bad food. The food extruders could only produce a thin, watery gruel that must have tasted terrible. This is another one of the vaults mentioned in the Fall of Bible, and we don't know anything else about it. This is going to be a bit of a stretch, but I imagine vault -Tec might have been testing a population's tolerance for a poor but easily creatable food source. You probably wouldn't want to rely on crops entirely, especially in case production systems fail or there's need for rationing. You'd want a secondary source of sustenance. But here's the thing with easily producible consumables, it's typically seen as bad compared to the real deal. On a spaceship where there's no choice but to have this stuff, who knows what the response would be. So I think by designing purposefully bad food and making it the only food available in Vault 36, vault -Tec was testing if an enclosed population could put up with it in shorter bursts. Here's hoping it wasn't intended for longer ones. Vault 42 was designed to not have any light bulbs of more than 40 watts. This is not good. I actually turned to a buddy of mine, Kopek, who knows more about technical stuff like this, and in his words, this would mean that the vault was living like mole people. As a result, you'd have a vault with extremely low light. Vault 42's experiment also appears to be a continuation of the Hawthorne experiments conducted in the 1920s at Hawthorne Works, an electric plant in Cicero, Illinois. The idea was to test if productivity would increase due to a change in lighting, and further research suggests that this may be the case. According to a study featured in the Journal of Environmental and Public Health, poor lighting quality can decrease work productivity and efficiency of the workers as well as being detrimental to one's health. Vault 42 was likely made to test whether vault -Tec could skim out on installing strong lighting. Tim Kaine mentions atomic power being used for the ships, but I imagine that's a finite resource in space. You wouldn't want it to go to waste. So whatever the energy source might be, it makes sense that you'd want it reserved for more critical systems, and I think that's why Vault 42 comes about. 
to see if the population truly needs strong lighting to be productive and healthy. Vault 43 is a vault comprised of 20 men, 10 women, and a panther. vault could have been studying to see the instinctual skills and coordination a population has in dealing with a threat on board the ship. They'd probably want to see if the crew could team up and overwhelm that threat instead of wasting precious ammunition, which would be a finite resource on the ship. Personally, I'd be interested to know what the panther was representative of. Clearly in the vaults, it's a panther, but if the vault's a test for space design, maybe it could be a literal animal breaking out, if the generation ship was like an ark and carrying animals on board. Or maybe this could just represent a crew member losing their mind and going berserk. Vault 51 was unusual, in that it did not have an overseer once the vault was sealed. Instead, Installed inside was a Zax supercomputer programmed to determine the best way of selecting an overseer. Sergeant Robert Baker was assigned as an assistant to Zax. The supercomputer took his ideas for a democratic election into account and listened to him when he said that a leader was someone who stepped up in times of crisis. This did not go well. The Zax computer took to inflicting increasingly worse crises upon the vault dwellers culminating in the entire vault being wiped out, save for one man named Reuben Gill. He was named the Overseer and promptly escaped the vault, though when he returned to defeat Zax, he learned that the vault was not fully automated. The vault eventually became one where players could play the... Oh god, no. the former battle royale mode, to determine who would become the overseer for the vault. Then, finally, there's the Appalachian Vault Registry, which features Vault 51. The file on the vault is damaged and the lettering not fully clear, but it can still be read. Vault 51, located in the northern quadrant of Appalachia, the lack of an overseer will test the limits of human tribalism directed by a prototype variant of the Zax experimental supercomputer. So, putting everything together, Vault 51 is a controlled environment without a definitive leader from the get-go. The Zax supercomputer is given the role of Vault Director, who aids the population by taking feedback, changing or enforcing rules, and literally determining the conditions of the environment. It seeks to find the best candidate for Overseer from the population, but it's a prototype, and it has a quirk that causes the death of nearly the entire vault. The evil it causes is not from going Skynet, but from taking the words of vault dwellers as literally as possible. But where does testing the limits of human tribalism play into this? Here's what I think. vault original intention for Vault 51 was to see if a control population would accept a leader that was chosen because of a Zack supercomputer. Over generations, would people put up with that? Would they factionalize or tribalize when a new overseer gets selected, when the machine decides it's time for a better fit? Or would they accept the status quo? One final note. The Zax model in Vault 51 is a prototype. It isn't given full control over the vault. Yet it leads to the death of every single inhabitant save one person. Maybe Vault 51 was as much a test for the computer as it was for the inhabitants, like a beta build for an AI starship director or assistant. It's just a shame about the bugs. In the Fallout Bible, Vault 53 was designed for most of its equipment to break down every few months. Though being repairable, the breakdowns were meant to stress out the inhabitants. Vault Tech was likely studying the effects of severe stress and anxiety in the context that they needed to know if a space crew could mentally withstand an environment where their repairs determine life or death. And those repairs can be needed at any time, who knows how many times. They'd also want to know the psychological or health related problems that arise from those stressful conditions. Now, I know the breakdowns were meant to be repairable, but I have to wonder what these poor vault dwellers were going through dealing with them. How worried they were 
if this was going to be the one, if this was the unfixable problem after so many breaks beforehand. I think placing someone in an environment with the ever-present anticipation of a horrible ordeal that threatens everyone you know, including all your loved ones, might give someone some health problems. In any case, I feel really bad for the repairmen at Vault 53. Another entry from the Fallout Bible, Vault 55 provided no entertainment tapes whatsoever. In a metallic labyrinth of corridors and rooms, would you really need a form of media entertainment to keep yourself happy? Could you entertain yourself, enjoying the company of your community, or would boredom consume you? Vault 55 was most likely meant to test if a spaceship would need some prepackaged form of media entertainment to keep people satisfied. Maybe there was some sort of fear that television had altered humanity into needing it, and so Voltec wanted to see if mankind could wean off filmed entertainment entirely in space, or if they would truly need it up there. Vault 56 had entertainment tapes, but only ones featuring an unfunny comedian. There's even some specific notes in the Fallout Bible that Vault 56 was anticipated to collapse far earlier than Vault 55. I think there is something to be said about media and entertainment in general, how it can affect us and even influence us on a spiritual level. So to provide only a poor form of entertainment might actually negatively influence a population. I think more than anything this is a dark joke in the Fallout Bible, but it still could make sense that Voltec wanted to test media's influence on a population, studying what the harm of giving them solely bad media to consume is. It probably didn't end well. Dicey, dicey. Vault 68 had a thousand residents, 999 being men and only one being female. It was likely that vault -Tec wanted to study a situation in which a population is overwhelmingly comprised of one sex, to learn how that population would function and what behavior would be exhibited. It might have been a way for vault -Tec to gather data accounting for a hypothetical scenario where one generation on the spaceship may have significantly more men than women. Having the research would help in aiding protocols or policies to prevent uh, madness. Vault 69 had 1,000 residents, 999 being women and only one being male. This is just a reverse of Vault 68, and I think it serves the same purpose except for studying responses from the opposite sex. How they'd react and what would happen to the population over time might be significantly different than how the men would react, so it's good to know. Located in Salt Lake City, Utah, Vault 70 was designed so its jumpsuit extruders failed after six months, which reduced clothing availability. Jumpsuit extruders were automated clothing makers that created vault jumpsuits for a given vault. Without one, clothing would become a finite resource in the vaults, and any jumpsuit would need to be preserved. In Interplace Fallout 3, Vault 70 would have also been home to many Mormon congregations who purchased spots in the vault together. So, just picture a bunch of Mormons having to contend with limited clothing. vault -Tec probably wanted to study a population's ability to either ration certain items or do without them before they're up in space, using a non-essential in the form of clothes. This is going to be a reach, but perhaps there might have been plans not to have jumpsuit extruders on the ship, but a set number of pre-made jumpsuits as a way of cutting corners to save budget and development time. Maybe by testing the reaction to Vault 70, vault would have been able to determine if they'd even need to install jumpsuit extruders, or if they were to be installed, if they'd necessarily need to work for a long period of time. Built under Malden Middle School in the Commonwealth, Vault 75 tested a eugenics program on its young inhabitants, comprised of the school students. Their parents were encouraged to admit them into the vault through a subsidized admittance offer. But when the bombs did fall, none of the adults were truly accepted by the vault. They were all executed. Meanwhile, the children were taught to fear the up top land, and that they would one day be helping it when they grew up to be big and strong. 
Upon turning 18 years old, a Vault 75 dweller would graduate. If they were deemed intelligent but physically lacking, they would become members of the Vault science team. If they were intelligent and physically built, they would be harvested for their organs or be used as specimens for future research. Those who failed the Vault standards entirely were executed after a graduation celebration. Vault 75 was meant to go on for generations, which points to the idea that vault Tech really wanted to know how to maintain or strengthen generations of a controlled population. On board a generation ship meant to go on for, well, generations, you'd want a consistently healthy, smart population of people. A crew without severe health problems leading to early deaths or doomed offspring, and smart enough to be capable, coordinated carriers of the space mission. And to accomplish this, vault Tech was toying with the idea of eugenics. For those who don't know, eugenics is the study and practice of ensuring good or improved genetics in a population, and the belief that there are proper ways of handling reproduction to ensure that the best, most desirable traits of a population are genetically passed down to the next generation. This is incredibly dark stuff, and seemingly, there were plans on bringing an extreme of it into space. A system of standardizing life on the ship, with treatment of any failures being flat out execution. Now, remember how Vault 11 had the sacrificial chamber? Originally, I thought it might be used for overpopulation, but as messed up as this is going to sound, it could easily have multiple uses. I also find it interesting that Vault 75's authorities demonize the outside world while also prepping the dwellers that there'd come a day they'd have to leave the vault in order to help the outside world. I like to think on the spaceship there really wouldn't be too much of a difference in the lessons taught except replace the up top land with the ship's final destination. Vault 77 was made to house only one inhabitant. After a year of isolation, the sole vault dweller found a box of puppets, and the results were... Not good. Perhaps vault Tech was studying the effects of social isolation. With only a box of puppets for company, the man inside Vault 77 lost his mind and became a serial killer in the wasteland. Evidently, people need human contact. Uh, puppets don't suffice. Vault 79 stored all of America's gold reserves to be used in the reconstruction of the United States and its economy. Gold. This rarefied metal has been the backbone of trade since time immemorial. And in the event of nuclear war, this precious resource will once again become invaluable to rebuilding America's economic future. That is why vault has been commissioned to build a different and very real vault. The vault didn't have any ulterior purposes. It really was a different and very real vault. It makes sense that some of that gold may have been intended to go into financing the generation ship's construction post-war. Vault 81 was built to house two populations a residential population, and scientific staff. The staff were hidden from the other residents, and according to the Prime Directive on the Overseer's Terminal, the Vault's mission was to research infectious disease and antibodies, with particular attention paid to potential mutations in a climate of heavy radiation. Clinical trials would be performed in three stages, with the third stage allowing testing on the residential population. Voltec was studying diseases to find universal cures for them, a goal in line with their other health-based intentions. On the generation ship, you'd want to be able to treat any illness and the like to preserve the lives of the space crew. I also think the attention to a climate of heavy radiation may have been a contingency in place for reactor meltdowns that might expose crew members to radiation poisoning, to test if experimental cures worked on them and their offspring, similarly to a non-radiated person. Vol 87 served as a testing site for the Evolutionary Experimentation Program, where the forced evolutionary virus was studied. 
Whatever original plan for the vault was scrapped in order for the staff to study FEV's effects and bring about the creation of super soldiers to help in the war effort. However, the FEV led to the creation of hostile super mutants who took control of the vault. Personally, I don't believe Vault 87 went into the space flight's design. Unless FEV was planned to make some kind of space super soldiers or guards, but I think it's unlikely. Your ride's over, Muty. Time to die. Vault 88 was created with the intent of studying and increasing human productivity through a number of prototype technologies. These include the Power Cycle 1000, a workout machine that produces energy, the water fountain, whose chemical properties allow for the choice of mood enhancer, appetite suppressant, or generic caffeination, the Phoropter, a medical device that allows for supplemental messaging, vault monitoring, and improved eye care, and lastly, there's the slot machine, which increases settler happiness at the cost of their humanity. Essentially, vault -Tec was looking to learn the limits of human productivity. The prototypes already come with different settings, some right, some wrong, but it's clear that researchers were looking to find some sort of sweet spot that would lead to high productivity without fatalities. Also, it's another big stretch, but you could say there's some overlap with Vault 88 slot machines and Vault 21. Think about it. Gambling in both leads to social stability, which in turn leads to happiness and increased productivity. Would you look at that? A gambling vault is a happy vault. Vault 92 housed some of the world's greatest musicians, promising them the chance to preserve musical talent in the face of nuclear Armageddon. It also utilized white noise mind suggestion combat experimentation, where ultra-low frequency white noise laced with subliminal messages would be played in order to influence people into following combat orders. The white noise would be played while the inhabitants slept, and it did have a noticeable effect. That being the vault's collapse, as the vault dwellers went insane and killed each other. But why do this to the world's finest musicians? Well, here's what I think. Musicians have exposure to different frequencies and types of sound, so perhaps vault -Tec was testing to see if an individual's prior exposure to these frequencies would nullify the effects of the white noise. Furthermore, it seems likely that white noise mind suggestion would be used for more than soldier conditioning or morale boosting. What if it was meant to be used on board the ship to condition passengers? Not to kill each other, hopefully, but to believe in the space mission or whatever vault -Tec thinks would make them a good space crew. Here's another idea. What if, in line with Vault 19, Vault 92's experiments were meant to perfect the ability to demonize and destroy problematic people on board the ship, either by using the white noise on passengers to turn against specific inhabitants, or even using the white noise on those inhabitants. Maybe by brainwashing them into becoming aggressors, the lie would go down more easily that they were deserving of being put down, and that your space superiors always know what's best for you. Vault 94 contained only non-violent religious inhabitants to test their ability to adapt to a post-apocalyptic setting. Tragically, the vault was eventually annihilated by outsiders. In terms of the generation ship, vault -Tec was likely testing to see how pacifists would react to an alien atmosphere, where one's ability to adapt and survive would be a necessity. Hostile alien life may be present, and by studying the reaction of pacifists in Vaults 94 to the likes of mutants and raiders outside, vault -Tec would have suitable data on whether inviting pacifists on board the ship would have made for a good idea. If they were invited on board, their ideas would likely carry across generations and may worsen the survivability chances of the ship. So, by proving their destructibility, vault -Tec may have been justifying certain regulations for the space crew list. Vault 95 was occupied by drug addicts given rehabilitation treatment. After five years of sobriety and developing family-like bonds, the residents were then told of a secret stash of chems that had been inside the vault all along. Immediately, the vault dissolved into chaos and destruction. 
As always, the question arises, why did Voltec do this? Though I personally think that they might have been looking to regulate well-off, well-connected, but severely chem-addicted people on the space list, another idea I have is that they were probably anticipating drug addiction on board the generation ship and whether rehabilitation would be enough to properly treat it. It's another reach, but hear me out. In certain science fiction, including Half-Life, some equipment makes use of built-in drug administrators. The HEV suit, for example, uses a morphine administrator to dull the damage Gordon gets. Major fracture detected. Automatic medical systems engaged. Morphine administered. And what would you know? Morphine is addictive. So are most pain relieving drugs and chems. On the chance that an accident occurs, if someone gets hurt and that chem is administered to them, can they be cured in the event of a drug addiction? Because there is going to be a hidden stash of chems on the ship, being finite medical supplies which will be an absolute necessity. You need to guarantee that a drug addict would be able to handle themselves knowing that there's a stash on board the ship. Even into the future, if there's people in Enclave brand HEV suits running around an alien planet, it'd be a good idea to know. Vault 96 tested the strength of mutant fauna, under a strict weekly quota enforced by a deadly computer mainframe. The creatures would be experimented upon and given further mutations, before being pitted against one another to see which one was the strongest. Under the threat of death, the Vault Dwellers met each quota, gathering information on countermeasures against mutation by learning from the defeated mutants while empowering the survivors. It got to a point where the mutation was so powerful, no further improvements or info could be gathered. The mainframe began taking lives, and a failed escape killed every Vault Dweller within Vault 96. Clearly, the understanding of mutant fauna and possible countermeasures against them was so important to Voltec that they made it a matter of life or death. Voltec most likely knew that the majority of fauna remaining on Earth would wind up irradiated and mutated, so instead of making Vault 96 an arc for the atomic age as promised, they embraced the mutations. We can also guess that there were plans to make use of the mutants and possibly take them into space, maybe as a bioweapon or maybe a species to be domesticated and further engineered upon. Sort of like an Outer Worlds type of deal. Vault 101 gave its overseers full authority over the vault. As we see in the events of Fallout 3, this didn't go over well. Overseer Alphonse was a cruel tyrant whose actions paved the way to a civil war. As the old saying goes, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. It appears vault was testing to see whether giving absolute power to a single person would negatively affect their population. Accounting for the other automated vaults, it likely wasn't planned to make the spaceship have only one sole human leader. Instead, I believe the grand plan was that power would be divided between a human authority and a computer system. Humans are flawed. Call it original sin or natural programming, but we're prone to be imperfect. And that's all without power, which can get to our heads and further bring out the worst in us. Meanwhile, an AI would really just be code. It'd be a logic-driven piece of software. If the software is bad or given harmful directives, that might cause issues. But these aren't human issues. These are programming issues and reasonably, you could fix them. You can't do the same with human issues, but with an AI, you could hypothetically create an authority figure that remains perfectly sensible over centuries of having power. The hope is that vault would perfect the type of prototype as seen in Vault 51 and install a logical, automated aid to help the human authority, guiding and advising them, or in the worst case scenario, taking over while looking for a suitable replacement. Vault 106 released psychoactive drugs through its ear filtration systems, causing its population to suffer hallucinations and eventually insanity. The vault's security forces were overpowered, 
with the sole survivors of the Vault becoming crazed killers. vault was studying the effects of psychoactive drugs, most likely to develop some kind of airborne weapon for the war or the spaceship. Going further with this, maybe similar to my idea with Vault 92, the hope was to create a method of inflicting delirium and insanity on certain problematic passengers, to manufacture a reason to put them down. Vault 108 has... Gary? Ah, Gary. Ha <laughs> Gary! Gary! It also has cloning technology. With roles left intentionally unfilled and systems meant to break down, it seems that vault was trying to cause a crisis scenario which would have led to death and propelled the residents into using the machine. A cloning machine would be good to address underpopulation. It'd also be great to replicate a good overseer or worker, as long as there's no kinks in the cloning process. Gary! Vault 111 tested cryostasis on a bulk of its inhabitants. Tim Kane outright states that testing long-term cryostasis would have played a role on the generation ship, with staff needing to unfreeze people to test if the machines were causing freezer burn or any damage to those in stasis. I assume that certain rich or esteemed passengers would be placed in cryostasis instead of living out their years on the ship because they had the money for it. Just as likely, there could have been a contingency plan in place where a chunk of passengers would be frozen and stored away for a time of crisis. Say there's low ship numbers after a massacre, or family trees are starting to look circular. But you need to make sure that freezing people over generations doesn't have any downside, so you get Vault 11. Vault 112 placed each of its inhabitants inside a virtual reality simulation controlled by an overseer. Unfortunately, the overseer went insane and took to torturing his residents for years. vault was studying what would happen if an overseer was given control over virtual reality. It seems they already knew this wouldn't be a good idea, so installed into the simulation was a failsafe to escape it. Perhaps virtual reality would have served an educational purpose on the ship. Children and other passengers may have been expected to go to mandatory conditioning courses or training sessions in the simulation pod, whether to be reminded of what they were fighting for or what they would be fighting ahead. So understanding how someone with authority behaves when given control over a virtual reality was important. Vault 114 placed rich citizens into a purposefully poorly designed and managed vault. The idea was to study their reactions and stress levels. If you take this vault to be an exaggeration of the generation ship, it does make some sense. The ship was most likely not going to be luxurious. It would have been suited for survival over pleasure. vault was likely studying the reactions to a bad vault to see how the wealthy would fear when taken out of their comfort zone. They were probably counting to bring some wealthy citizens on board the ship, so knowing a hypothetical reaction, whether they could take it or would break down, would have helped to know. Vault 118 was originally intended to have 300 lower class residents and 10 wealthy ones, who were given full authority over the poor. This plan actually didn't come about due to the embezzlement of construction funds, but if it had, what was the goal? More than likely, the generation ship would have different roles, including some powerful authorities. Perhaps the ten wealthy rulers were representative of a ship's elite, having their own chambers and luxury, if you could call it that, whereas the rest of the crew would be workers, not quite living the same life. The question is, would this foster tension? There's also been a recurring theme throughout the vaults we've covered, where you give a person full control over something, and it usually leads to chaos. It's hard to be king with the corruption and ego that can cause. Vault 118 was probably just a study to hammer home the importance of an AI helper. So there's not just faulty human leaders at the helm of humanity's last hope. In Fallout 76, Bruiser is part of the Blackwater Bad Boys group of raiders. He once lived in a vault, which he recalls some memories of, playing a brutal gladiatorial game. That was probably just football. It's not a lot to go off of, but more than likely, 
we would have been giving ourselves brain damage amongst the stars. And that's everything for the vaults. If you've watched this long, I really want to thank you for doing it and I hope you enjoyed. I'm going to keep making these kinds of video essays into the future, so if that's something you like or you have any suggestions for content, let me know in the comment section below. If you'd like to support the channel in any way, I have a Patreon and a PayPal set up because unfortunately, YouTube is vault tech. This is what YouTube is and will continue to be. And frankly speaking, I just trust you guys way more than YouTube. So only if you liked what you saw and think I deserve it, consider supporting the channel. Anything helps and will go directly to Adobe subscriptions for the editing or getting better equipment to make better videos. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, watch yourselves out there and be sure not to go into any Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. Sign up now and prepare for the future.